RCR with Paul Brennan, Reality Check Radio. It's Friday morning on Reality Check Radio. That is our political panel morning. I know many of you are looking forward to this feature now. And let's get straight into it with Cam Slater. Hi, Cam. Good morning, Paul. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Box of fluffy somethings. Olivia Pearson. Hi, Olivia. Hello, Paul. And from Wood Panelling Central, <laughs> Marty Gibson. It is the panel, so that's appropriate. Good to see you or hear from you, Marty. Yeah, hi, Paul. All right. A lot to, to cram in here. Let's start with the Tesla. Oh, the Tesla. Yeah, well, Christopher Luxon, he really doesn't have any political instincts, does he? You know, seven months ago, he, he was told by um, parliamentary services he was entitled to a uh, self-drive car and, and under the Ardern edict, it had to be electric. And so he said, oh, well, I'll have a Tesla like my I'll have a Leaf. Should have done a Leaf. Or Musk. And he went straight to the top. He wanted the highest, you know, um, the most expensive one he could find, decided he'd have a Tesla. Of course, he'd forgotten that the week before that he'd been railing against subsidies for electric cars for Tesla owners, saying they're all rich pricks, et cetera. And, um, and then uh, somebody who is a little bit smarter is probably someone like Jerry Br- Brownlee, who has good political instincts, said to, said to Luxem, yeah, this isn't a good look, mate. Um, you're going to look like a dork. And um, someone's going to find all those statements that you made. And um, so it's probably best if you don't take the car. And so he decided that he wouldn't take the car. And, um, of course, the media have um, sat on this for seven months or so. And, of course, they sprung it um, earlier in the week. And Luxon showed how flat-footed he was in dealing with these sort of gotcha moments instead of, you know, screaming out that um, I decided to, to get a Ute or, you know, I prefer V8s or something like that. No, no, he decide, he he comes up with some cockamamie excuse about, I know I decided I didn't need it. or No one's going to buy that. Don't they and, already have one in the family? Yes, Mrs. has got one. Okay. It's a girl's car anyway. Now, lacking the sort of judgment that you're speaking about, that's is that good for running a country? No, I don't think it is. I don't think he's got any political um, instincts. You know, he, he, he was caught again this week um, at field days saying that, um, you know, New Zealand's become very, we, we, um, what is it, wet and woke and, and horrible and disgusting. And everything. But this is the guy who's wetter than an otter's pocket complaining about the country being wet. I mean, when he was running in New Zealand, it was the wettest it ever was. <laughs> and you know, and woke. So, you know, his, his political instincts are crap. They're, they're, he's almost like the Scott Morrison of the New Zealand poli- political scene. You know, remember Scott Morrison was, was yeah, I think it was Scott Morrison. He was he's caught, exactly like Scott Morrison. He was caught, um, you know, on camera saying about a soldier that had been killed. Well, well shit happens. <laughs> You know, and it's not a good look when it comes out. And that's what Luxon, he's always caught flat footed. And then he has a competition with the French army on who can march the bit backwards the fastest. He could work for a wetter workshop. Wetter. Yeah, get that. yeah, he could. Okay. That's my attempt at humor. The only one in this program. Marty, you got anything terrible, to say? That's you got terrible. anything to, uh, to, I've, I've, to say about I've that? I've given. Christopher Luxon, quite a few beatings over quite a few things. But um, I, I think this says more about the media sitting on it for seven months. and uh, it does. It does. And, and then spread. And it's sort of possibly because if you look at the demographic of New Zealand's media, it's similar to the sort of Remuera Green voter. You know, ladies, sort of socialist. He, he shouldn't expect uh, an easy ride from them. Yeah, it's the it's the leafy suburbs. Wet woke women vote that you know undermines the country every election. Take that. Meantime, they're driving their Teslas around. Yeah. Could he have turned that into a gold moment by just being staunch and saying, "Look, it's an electric car. What do you, they they make us have it in you know, self drive. Much rather have someone else driving for me. But hey, if I got to do it, I'll take this one. Rack off." A competent a competent politician would have turned it into a into a. A, a story that was good for him. But unfortunately, um, Christopher Luxon isn't a competent politician. He just lacks. Do, do, do people actually use the self-drive feature in these cars? Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> no. You, 
I don't think you can in New Zealand. Mm. But but when I say self drive, it's not for for the car to self drive. It's for him to drive so he doesn't have a driver. So it's he's driving it himself. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but with Teslas, you got to ask that question because they do basically self drive. I've been in one that's done it. It's weird. Mm, Tell you that strange. you could always donate it to charity, you know, like Meals on Wheels. Well, a, they're actually a boat anchor. Who wants one? You know, you, they go like a cut cat, you know, for for two hundred kilometers, and then they're sitting on the side of the road, plugged into something, while we all sail past in our utes. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> any, any more comments to make about this terrible thing? No. Oh. No, moving on then. Okay, RNZ scandal. Oh, come on, Paul, you can well, kick this one off. Well, well, is it actually a scandal? Well, I actually think it is, but not for what you think it is. Okay, I mean, well, let's every, hear that. Well, everyone knows they, they've been called Red Radio for years, right? Um, and, you know, I used to mock the Labour Party politicians. It's funny because the Labour Party thinks that, that um, Red Radio is conservative, and everyone who's conservative thinks that Red Radio is communist. Yeah, I've noticed that too. That's a good point. But um, what's happened there is there's been some, you know, well, let's say it is editorial policy because I can't believe that a minion has been editing uh, st wire stories from Reuters and the BBC um, and putting his own worldview into those stories that's pro Palestine, Palestinians, pro Russia, pro China. Um, all these sorts of things have been happening, and it's been going on for years. And it, it probably in, involves hundreds, if not thousands, of articles. Now, there's this big outcry because you know, oh, it's terrible. They've been editing these and and putting this bias and slant. Well, the BBC and Reuters are bent anyway, so <laughs> he's made them more bent. But I think the, the legal Im implications, which haven't really been mentioned so far, is that these wire services have contracts that say you, you're you not to edit these things. You just, you're, you're supposed to publish them as they are with a link to where you got the story from. And I think that's a, a real big one there. But they're throwing the journalist under the bus without actually looking at his bosses. And they obviously don't read their own stuff. No, that's, that's the other thing. Like that, that, they haven't noticed that this has been going on for years, because but nobody they, nobody but, reads. The editors aren't editing. Well, they haven't got any sub editors clearly, because like there was one story that was taken from Reuters that talked about um, Israeli resort town of Iliad, and it was edited to say that it was an Egyptian town huh. uh, called, called Iliad, but. And you know, talking about it was, um, you know, uh, uh, it was there was a, a dispute over who who should have that town. But that that was settled years ago. Egypt never had a claim on Iliad. Transjordan did, and in 1949, it was settled in favour of Israel. So there's never been a claim since independence, basically, of Israel that this is an Israeli town. But this this guy had edited it to say that it was an Egyptian town. Yeah, just factually but, I mean, incorrect. You know, but but they but they, I I can't understand why they don't just um, dump them and let them fall on the free market with a subscription model or something like what you do, Cam, or exactly, you know, and see how long they'll survive without taxpayer funding. <coughs> um, they don't take themselves that seriously, so why the hell should we? But but here's the thing, like it, it is pretty bad what they've done in some of these edits. Like another one was talking about the democratically elected Hamas government, right? So yeah, yeah, Mahmoud yeah. Abbas. They haven't had an election for how long? Eighteen years. Yeah, eighteen. Um, years. Mahmoud yeah. Abbas um, is in his eighteenth year of his four year term. Yeah. So okay. Abu. So so they talk about Abu Mazen like he's the elected leader of the Palestinians when he's actually a dictator. Yeah. Um, and and a terrorist leader. And a terrorist leader of, a, yeah. of an outrageous organisation that is all around the world except in New Zealand, uh, marked as a terrorist organisation. Yeah. So, you know, I think you're right, uh, Olivia, that you just think about it. Willie Jackson was wanting to merge these guys with TVNZ to, into this massive media enterprise 
that would be unchallenged in terms of resourcing and every, anything else. And we now find out that Radio New Zealand is completely bent from, from the senior management down at, with their slant. There's no way this guy would have operated uh, in a vacuum doing these things, you know, surreptitiously. He, he was acting under instruction. He has to have been. And we could have had that. But I think your solution is the best. Throw it on the open market. See if they can find someone who will pay for it. And then see if somebody will monetize it and walk away from it. It's, it's always the, the simplest solutions are the best, aren't they? And it's what the, uh, for, for those of us that um, are still deluded that we live in a capitalist system, we do not. Right. Um, and that is very evident by our media and the fact that it's all just government funded. They're corrupt. They've been corrupted by government funding. It's, it's amazing how jealously they guard the starting points. This is all about starting points. You're not allowed to talk about uh, the. Uh, CIA-sponsored coup that that preceded uh, the invasion of Ukraine. You're not allowed to talk about climate change in a, from a point that doesn't uh, give you upward warming. Uh, well, Anything to do with Maori? Yeah, France. you're not allowed to talk about the musket wars I see in the uh, in Comrade Cindy's um, uh, new it, syllabus. Hmm. Even though more um, more New Zealanders died in that than World War One and Two combined, um, it's the erasure of history that that uh, that bothers me. Yeah, it bothers me too, Marty. It's that's what makes it so Maoist, mm. right? Is this um, re having to readdress history on every front and wipe it out? It's so it's so sinister. Well, uh, by omission is the same thing, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretending something never happened. No, we yeah. don't talk about that. memory hold. It, yes. we don't. Yeah. We, we don't, don't talk, talk about, about the, the medieval warm period. No, no, we don't talk about the war. No, no. And uh, speaking of the war, I, I have a sort of fascination with this conflict. I stay up to date with all the military movements as best you can. There are some channels out there that do that. Not because I support any of them, but I'm curious about you know the act what's actually happening. And I can say, I think, quite uh, confidently that Kiwis know nothing. Mm, yeah, very good. Actually nothing. They don't know how this originated. And that's only, that's only, you know, 80 years out from the Second World War where America came to our complete rescue because yeah. Churchill couldn't afford troops to come down and protect New Zealand, so America did it. And it could, um, be, could be argued that Russia actually won that war, Second World War, ultimately. Well, they're the ones who... Basically, mate, won the race to Berlin, didn't they? Yeah, my point is, our information from these uh, institutions, let's say, is is not accurate at all, anyway. Well, we we've seen that through though through the you know the COVID debacle, on how information was prevented from getting out into the public, and now it's all starting to come out, and you know people like myself and. And you, Paul, and others who are very public about, you know, the origins of this virus and and p potential um, uh, solutions for combating it, and all, it's all coming. It's all it's all being proven that that we were right. You know, I don't know how we were right, but we were. You know, but ninety five percent of the population just tugged their forelocks and asked how high they could jump. Well, what's the point of taxpayers' money going into, let's say, RNZ, when they could build a lot of houses? Well, it could, it, it's it, not it's, just that. It's multiple millions. It could, it could be reallocated to a more purposeful use. Well, it's not just Radio New Zealand. I mean, you know, you've got well, TVNZ all the, then. You, well, well. No, but, but, but you've got all these lobbies who are expecting millions and millions of dollars to be poured into the concert program. Buy all those fools a Spotify account, for fuck's sake. Yeah. <laughs> Beep. Um, yeah, or your CD collection, which is probably still sitting somewhere. Yeah. That's the safest way is a CD collection because as soon as they do an internet blackout, your Spotify won't work. Yeah. Boo -hoo. Still got a CD player in the car, actually. And I still play CDs in it, and they sound great. I okay. still love DVDs, you know. It's yeah. my favourite format. It doesn't buffer or anything. It's no, great. it doesn't. You're right. <laughs> Those pre-buffering days. Oh. All right. Um, do we say much more um, about RNZ? One thing I've noticed is the what do we make of the CEO of RNZ and his handling of this? 
well, maybe there's a, a, a internal fight to white ant Paul Thompson and get rid of him. I mean, he's a Labour lackey anyway, so no one's going to save him. Do we know the relationship between the broadcasting minister and him? I don't, but I'm just wondering because Willie presumably had a plan and it didn't work out. Well, there, there's a better relationship or previous relationship between one of Jacinda Ardern's former chief of staff, who was his brother, and him. That was a much closer. Paul Thompson's brother is Gordon John Thompson, and oh, he's, okay. he's a PR um, and spin merchant, but he was a, um, one of Jacinda Ardern's chief of staff for a while. I didn't know that. We learn something every day. It's a big club and we're not in it. No. <laughs> I'm okay with not being in it. Yeah. All right. Do we um, have anything more to say about Auntie RNZ? Sell it. Aye. Sell it. Is it worth anything? Doesn't matter. Sell it for whatever you can get. Like stuff. Yeah. Maybe One we dollar. should buy it. Take it over. It's too for expensive to operate. Way too expensive. Those transmitters cost cost the earth. All right. Moving on. This is a, an interesting one because I remember asking David Seymour or putting it to him that the media was the problem in New Zealand and something had to be done about it. And he pushed back and he said, are you suggesting that we control the media? And I said, kind of, yeah, actually, if, if, if it's an emergency national security issue, maybe. Anyway, I see Winston and David Seymour on the list here call for media bias inquiries. So he's back on board by the sounds of things. Well, you know, Winston Peters is, came out with it first and said that it's clear clear there's bias in the in the media now, and we need to have a, a royal commission of inquiry. And Seymour, two days later, put, started talking about having an inquiry just into Radio New Zealand. So it's good to see that both of them are on the same page, considering they'll probably have to be working together at the end, after the election. Oh, do you think but, so? But I, I do actually do think we need to have uh, an inquiry into media, media bias, media funding, and, you know, perhaps look at uh, some of the redress that needs to occur, like maybe repayment of the public interest journalism fund um, sums, and if that sends some of the media outlets broke, well, so be it. But um, I think the corrupting influence of state money needs to, you know, needs to go. And Elon Musk had the right idea in tagging all of these organizations if they receive government money saying that they're government funded in some way so that you can that actually was beautiful but then he reneged on it and they lost their badge um that annoyed me um but really i mean knowing how corrupt everything is why would a commission of inquiry be any, any less corrupt because you know into the covid response remember when they talked about a commission of inquiry into that. They weren't allowed to mention viruses. They weren't to mention um, vaccines. There were all these uh, huge um, topics that they weren't allowed to broach. So I just don't think you'd get to the truth through something like that that comes through the crown. I really don't. And isn't no, operating the media you. this way too useful? Say again, Paul. Isn't operating the, having the media operating as it does, it's kind of too useful to some people. It's useful to have this. Well, it's an industrial complex. Well, if you're going to bury stories and, and omit angles and, and so on and so forth, you, you can work that to your advantage if you're a power person. The only media I trust is thrown onto the free market, has a subscription model or, um, or donors that are well-declared um, that obviously don't come from government. But, I mean, as for the rest, you just can't trust a word they write. I think I jumped in on you before, Marty. What were you about to say? Oh, I, I, I can't remember. Um. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. Um, so, yeah, Royal Commission. Yeah, so what is what you're saying, Olivia? Big deal. Well, I'm just saying that they, they, they'd, be, they'd be as corrupt as everything else we see. I just would have no faith that they would get to the truth or even care what it was. Well, maybe they should appoint us to the Royal Commission. Yeah. Would that, would that make you happy? Yes, it would. It would. <laughs> Probably get a result. Mm. But yeah. here's the thing. How do you, I guess Seymour had a point. How do you manage the media without constricting its freedom so much? Well, it's simple. Uh, if you they do choose this, to be biased, what can you do about it? You do it the same way that they do in the United States. Yes, there's some public broadcasting or, or you know, 
organ organizations uh, in the United States, but mostly it's free enterprise. But the United States has laws that say that in a, in a state of emergency, in in certain circumstances, they can come in over the top uh, and take a, take some space in the broadcasting of these other organizations, private organizations, to get the public interest uh, information out there. And that could be very easily done here in New Zealand. It's a whole lot easier than it would be in the United States because they've got you know a federal system and the state systems and all of those. We could do it much easier here, and we should just do that. Sell all these off. We don't need to have state-funded media in that. Absolutely much. not. That's exactly what we don't need. And um, and and just have a law that says that in a state of an emergency, the government can come in for you know very limited sort of things to um, pass out a message, and that's the end of it. All right. Yeah, the, the thing that was missing in a lot of you know people talked about the public interest journalism fund. Um, but the amount of advertising that government was also doing, you know, the full and apparently, I mean, I, I haven't seen anything um, that absolutely confirms this, but I did hear that it was full rack price. You know, they weren't full retail. Getting, yeah, full full retail price. So I mean, that um, I mean, just in the small paper I worked for, the 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 council, the iwi, and the the district health board used to advertise in it a lot, and it it wasn't just to put information out there, it, it did give them a string to pull uh, if they needed to. I wrote a wrote a couple of stories about um, tribes that were getting their claims squashed by the iwi that uh, didn't run uh, because of a, uh, uh, a call or a letter from uh, Kiri Tapu Allen's law firm, which um, was owned by the uh, son of the iwi leader. Um, it, it, it's... Uh, it, it, that distortion takes all sorts of forms. Well, if you talk to Peter Williams, he'll tell you about that. Um, yeah. And I know people who were, were making three or four or sometimes even more new updated COVID commercials a day. Mm. The scripts would come in and they'd turn them around. The last one had come in around 6.37 at night. It was that intense. So you can imagine the turnover going on there at full retail. Mm. It was all well, done a lot of those media retail. companies were on their knees, weren't they? Hmm. But, but, it's like the, but it's like the MIQ, um, you know, debacle. All of those hotels and motels that provided MIQ services were paying, were doing it at full rack rate, full rack rate. And that goes for the um, the emergency housing as well. You know, I know that in, in Rotorua. Yep. Um, it, it was. It, you make more money having the, the emergency housing than the actual tourists. And the good thing is, you know, tourists get upset if things aren't clean and tidy. Um, indigent people don't care. All right, let's um, move on to oh, Jenny Anderson gaslighting again. Is she a gaslighter of the week award? Well, um, she's nominee. She's- She's up there. Um, we'll have to have a, a vote for who gets that. But, uh, yeah, she was in Parliament last week skiting on about delivering 800 new police and everything. And then this week they've had a, a ceremony at the police college for the latest. But the, even the police union has come out and said, the police association has come out and said, well, you know, you actually haven't delivered those 1,800 cops because – about 270 of them aren't in the front line. They're, you know, basically glorified Excel spreadsheet data entry people. Unauthorised officers. Unauthorised officers, no powers of arrest, not, uh, not, not sworn. Not, not uh, sworn. Not sworn. And so, you know, this is yet again Jenny Anderson gaslighting us that they've delivered. I mean, the promise was to deliver them by 2020, and it's now 2023, and they're going on, that aren't we wonderful? But, I mean, I guess we could give them a pat on the back for actually achieving more than any of their other promises, like, you know, Kiwi Build, where's the 100,000 houses, the billion trees, the bridge across Auckland (coughs) Harbour, light rail to Mount Roskill. None of that's happened. So, I mean, they've had a good go at this one. Would more police make any difference? It seems that uh, the police of today are not the police of old, let me put it that way. Well, it'll be more police standing by watching gang members take over towns, I guess. Or attending mm. protests. Yeah, there was recently that story about how there were these arrests on um, these uh, dirt bike riders in South Auckland. Um, 
I had a conversation a couple of years ago with a, a policeman who was outraged, was stationed in Manurewa and uh, had been told, don't arrest them, it's it's unsafe. And so he said the, um, the wow. locals just hated them because they just saw them standing by and watching these people just mock them, no helmets. Well, there was a picture in the paper the other day of uh, two new police recruits, two young women, and they look like fine young women. No problem with that. But, uh, you know, they don't look like they could enforce with any sort of intensity a situation. No, they've got oh. blocks, though. Oh, okay. Well, I hadn't factored that in. But I'm thinking of our local cop where I grew up. You, you just would not want to have done anything to get on the wrong side of him. You knew that. No, oh, my co- my cousin was a police officer in Waiuku and and um, back in the day, and uh, he used to tell me how he'd sort a few. You know, there was particular crimes had the signature of some local that he knew, and he'd just go around and drag them out of their house or go and confront them at the pub and take them out the back and give them a hiding and say you know, bring all that stuff back. But you can't do that anymore. That. <laughs> yeah, but you know, we we could go a bit harder, couldn't we? Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I've got a friend who was a, a cop like that who uh, I think was one of the most decorated police officers in New Zealand I think had a, the most assault charges against him uh, <laughs> during his time in the police. But he's horrified watching all this stuff unfold. And, we're, uh, you know, I'm privy to exchanges he has with friends who are also ex-cops and the word cowardice gets thrown around a fair bit. Yeah, I bet. I bet it does. I mean, you want you. We all have a vested interest in trusting our police force and respecting them. You raise your kids to respect the police. Blah blah blah. Um, but that's gone. Seem, that's that's they, gone, Olivia. It's yeah, gone. I know. They they don't seem to respect themselves, um, and it's all gone woke um, thanks to people like Cuddles Costa, um, and. <laughs> You know, we but they, they did it to themselves. I mean, you know, yeah. you take the firearms community of which I'm a, a member of, and there's 250,000 of us. We've all been police vetted. We're all being declared a fit and proper person, so to speak. But since um, you know, 2018, 2019, we've been treated like criminals. And the first default attitude of the police is that you, you've done something wrong. And, and a, a good example of this is I had an inspection at my house and um, they said, oh, look, you know, where's these pistols? And um, I br- pulled them all out and I said, but don't, you're not going to be able to, that shouldn't be on my license, that one, because I sold it. And the guy who was um, who was doing the inspection just straight away said, oh, well, I have to caution you that you've disposed of this pistol illegally. And I said, well, hang on a second. You're not a sworn police officer, so you can't caution me. Secondly, um, it's not a pistol, it's a revolver. And thirdly, um, I haven't disposed of it illegally. I've disposed of it legally. I sold it at the same time as that one there, and it was processed by the same police officer on the same day at the same event. So if you've lost the paperwork, it's not my fault. But his default position was that I was a criminal and that I disposed of it illegally and things were going to get hard for me from from that moment forward. And he continued on with that, and I asked him to leave. I said, just leave. He said, I haven't finished. I said, I don't care. Leave. You're accusing me of a crime, and I haven't committed a crime. Leave. And that was their default position, was to straight away go to you're the criminal, and and now the 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 changes that they're making to the firearms laws are even worse. It's like there's pre-crime, you know, where they think you might possibly sometime in the future commit a crime. So, uh, you know, we're going to take your license off. Yeah, that's that's and, that's. and so they wonder why we we no longer respect them. You know, mm-hmm. I, I used to go out of my way to help the police. Now I wouldn't cross the road. No, or, you wouldn't cross it. And look what they did to Dewa Deboer. I know, just um, appalling his family and taking that information off a government submission he'd made about firearms and stuff like that. I mean, really just despicable. But it was privileged information. It was at a select committee. Yeah. So so they broke the law in doing it. Yeah, and then raided him. And then raided him. Mm. So, yeah. And how, how do we explain the policing then in Apotiki? Because I think someone mentioned it. And what policing? 
Uh, and compare that to what happened at Parliament, it seems to me completely diametrically opposed groups well, of people in their attitude to life and, and the way they behave, yet um, a whole bunch of one side gets mowed over like a bulldozer's come at them and, and the others get to do kind of what they want. Well, that, well, that's the thing, isn't it? If you're in a gang and you've got a patch, you've committed a crime to get that. You're a criminal. Yeah, a few. And, yeah. and they get treated with kid gloves. Almost all of these um, gang members in a potiki um, will have at least 20 or 30 convictions against their name. And the police aren't policing. But a few knitters and um, you know some people who have lost their jobs and are a little bit mad um, standing on the fore court of parliament saying to politicians, please come and talk to us. Well, well yeah. you get you get the right squad. You get the tear gas. You get the grenade launchers. You get the the sound weapons. You get all of that. Mm. And oh, by the way, we're going to burn and trash all of your stuff and throw it all in a bin. Yeah. Where are Hello? the sound weapons in a potiki? Yeah. Well, governments love anyone anything that uh, makes people demand less freedom and more government, and so gangs fit that bill fatherless kids fit that bill the ineffective education fits that bill the prisons that don't rehabilitate prisoners and are run by gangs fit that bill so if you look at it in that context it makes perfect sense <clears throat> yeah there's a piece by kate hawksby i see that she's written and uh, there was apparently a report on one news i would never see that because i never watch it but it seemed to be very kind of happy talk about the gangs and how the gang leader who was killed was some, some pillar of the community kind of reporting that that way. Uh, so drilling down, uh, I mean, how do we explain this? Is it fear? Someone mentioned fear before. I think it was you, Marty. Is it some kind of perverse sympathy? What could it, it be? That, that they need boogeymen to make people demand less freedom and more government. Right. Oh, well, we saw that We saw that yesterday with Chris with Christopher Luxon, who came out and said, oh, well, we need to have warrantless searches to try and find illegal guns. N no, Chris, we don't need warrantless searches because once you have warrantless searches, the police can just kick in your door and turn over your house for whatever reason they want. There's a reason why we have warrants. I it's can't so believe he would say that. He That's did. There's a whole Facebook video of it, and him saying, what a fascist. We want warrantless searches. No. No, we don't. There's no, we do case not. after case after case in the courts where the police have breached the conditions of the warrant that they obtained. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but some people will demand that, and, and that's, you know, what do they want more than people demanding warrantless searches of people's houses? Um, I, I saw that there was in uh, yesterday's Herald uh, Thursday Police have uh, also today obtained a search warrant under the Criminal Activity Intervention Legislation Act 2023, which allows police to search vehicles of suspected gang members and seize their weapons during times of conflict. So they've done it uh, yesterday, sort of closing the door after the, uh, the barn door, after the horse has bolted. But it's good to know that at least Winston Peters is, you know, calling this out and saying that they need to be um, held to the same standard as um, terrorists when it comes to um, gangs. And um, if, if the Proud Boys can be declared a terrorist organisation, then the mongrel mob and the Black Power sure as hell can as well. Um, I know Winston Peters has been saying this for a long time, that we need to ban the gangs. Um, well, he's come out today and said we need to actually declare the gangs to be terrorist organisations. If we... If we've made the Proud Boys in the United States a terrorist organisation at the stroke of a pen, why can't we do that with Black Power, Mongrel Mob, Headhunters and all the rest of them? Yeah. And, I mean, he said that about a year ago. He was going on about uh, them being the gangs are a social cancer and we've got to ca cut the cancer out. Um, no more hugs, no more grants, no more speaking at hooey's. No more tolerance. We need to bang the gangs. Yeah. And I mean, shutting down streets, the kids can't go to school. Um, just the intimidation, the the barking, the 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 um throwing around firearms. I mean, how intimidating for a New Zealand town, just despicable. And why are they allowing it? This must go back to Jacinda. I mean, Winston's hit, hit the right notes. I mean, you 
Christopher Luxon said, oh, we need warrantless searches. Winston Peters says, well, we don't need yeah. to. We've got a Terrorism Suppression Act here. Yeah. Let's declare these organisations, these gangs, terrorist organisations. Now the full force of the law and additional resources can be applied to them legally and have at it. Yeah. And that Ra- Wa- Rawari Waititi, I never say that name properly, um, I mean, what a what a piece of work he is, you know, going on about right now. Christopher Luxon and Chris Hipkins need to shut their mouths. And where's he? Where's keep, he? Keep at my the moment? out of your mouth. Where's he at the moment? Oh, that's right. The great anti-colonialist is in the UK at Cambridge University, participating in a debate over whether the whether the Commonwealth is a, an effective organisation for a modern society. And in his press release, he basically labels King Charles a terrorist. <laughs> right? Like, this is the status of this guy. This is nuts. Uh, but, but, I mean, men, a man like um, Rawiri, he cannot raise the level of polemic any higher than used to shut up. You know, that's what that comes down to is shut up. And, uh, you know, really, I mean, He's an embarrassment uh, to Maori as as much of an embarrassment as the mongrel mob are and the black power are. And I noticed one astute lady on your Twitter feed, Kate, Cam said, um, Kate said, if, you know, after Rawari said, keep my iwi out of your mouth, right? She said, if that's the road he wants to go down, let's keep te reo out of our mouths too and we'll see how <laughs> this works. Mm. He'd have her pockets. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it's it's an appalling. I mean, calling the king a terrorist, he should be charged with sedition. Who should be? Rawiri Waititi. Rawari. Calling the king, a, calling the the king a terrorist, and the head of a terrorist organization. That's what he said. Off he should be charged with sedition. Well, Off I mean, we think that, but many people in the freedom movement would just love that rhetoric. It's just rubbish. Before we get off the um, aspects of policing, and we've talked about a potiki, another gaslighting opportunity or award opportunity here, uh, a potiki mayor um, gaslighting us over the mongrel mob. What's the potiki mayor been saying? Well, David Moore, David Moore says um, that all these claims of 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 the town being held to hostage is a figment of our imagination. It's, it's like he's been reading Ginny Anderson. Ginny script. Anderson. <laughs> so, uh, maybe they're a joint award. But, yeah. um, you know, the, it says the town isn't being held hostage by gang members amid concerns of a possible turf war in a potiki. Well, it, mm. it's, it's patently not true. I mean, the guy needs to open his eyes. Is he on the Labour Party list, do you reckon? Uh, actually, it's, probably <laughs> fe- it's actually probably fear. He has to live in the town. Uh, he, could be, and, he, could be fe- he could be fearful. Yeah, yeah but if safety. one school had to shut down, if one school had to keep its kids home after everything we've been through in the last three years with flipping lockdowns and bullshit like that, that let's face it, the government have now got people used to, if one school had to keep their kids back, and they did in the Potiki, um, then they are being held to ransom. Fact. All right, party leaders trade jabs at field days. Uh, well, I'm not really interested in what um, Hipkins has got to say about Luxon or what Luxon's got to say about Hipkins. What was the most interesting part of that was Winston Peters reiterating that he is not going to work with liars. And it doesn't matter that they've got rid of Jacinda Ardern. Our Labour Party, led by Christopher Hipkins, is still a party of liars, and he's not going to go into any sort of coalition arrangement with them. Wow. Huh. That's, a, that's a change of tune, isn't it? Well, he said from it, how he's done things in the past. He said it about six months ago, and everyone's saying, "Oh, but he he said this crowd, and you know now they've changed. You know he's got room to wiggle. Well, there's no room to wiggle on the words that he's used in this. Why are people so twisted up about Winston? Uh, it's what? like tr- it's like Trump derangement syndrome. It's like Winston derangement syndrome. That especially National Party people, they've got this this fetish of hating Winston and they hold him to unreasonable standards that they wouldn't hold any other politician to. And and, and Olivia's about to say, well, he tells he tells bloody lies and he never delivers his bottom lines. And, you know, the other day somebody on my site was saying, you know, 
um, Winston never delivers his bottom lines, and and you know I, he he um, he betrayed us. And I said, hang on a second, you didn't vote for him, so how did he betray you? And and that's the point that I always make to people. They say, oh, Winston doesn't deliver his bottom lines. And said, well, the voting pop public only gives him about five percent. You can't expect a five percent party to get all their bottom lines. It's 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 completely erroneous thinking. And it's not that I'm pro Winston or anything. It's just there's this unreasonable, and and I used to be, you know, I used to be party to it. I used to slag off Winston all the time, and and I've I've gone back over some of the things that I wrote, and I thought, you know, that was just so blinkered and so so you know um, biased on the basis of what you know it, the public doesn't give him enough votes to be able to get his bottom lines and then they turn around and criticize him for not delivering the bottom lines you know? and then they say once the baubles of office i asked him about that last week here he yeah. told he told me well if i took the baubles i would have taken the knighthood yeah that was a fine moment wasn't it in that interview i thought yeah um, i but but i mean just just in the name of truth can you know, the reason I've got something, you know, up my nose with Winston Peters is, was when he did have the balls of office, that um, UN migration compact that he signed and delivered in darkness that was very secretive um, between him and Jacinda Ardern. It was an appalling betrayal of this country. I can't look at him the same way after that. I like him. He's a rascal, as, as you often say. Um, he's definitely, Scallywag. yeah, all, all that. But when he was there as foreign minister, um, that was a betrayal of New Zealand. And we are still paying for that. And every time these migrants come in, that, that, that migration compact, remember, was emptying the migration, um, especially the Muslim uh, migration um, camps that were all through Europe, emptying them into countries. Now, I always maintained if you're going to put Muslims en masse into any Western country, that's, there's a mistake because it doesn't seem very compatible um, with Western yeah. um, liberal, li liberalism. They should be placed in the Ummah. There are like 52 Muslim countries where these people could be placed, and they're always talking about their brethren, their brethren, their brethren. Well, it's like take your brethren, but they don't. They want to be they want to force themselves into Western democracies, and Winston helped that. Yeah. Um, and at our expense, I mean, it's $100,000 a year per refugee. But here's the thing, years. Olivia, the mark of a politician, a great politician, is one that will admit his mistakes. Well, has he admitted that one? Well, I'm not sure that he has, but I'm sure that he does regret some of the things that happened when he was foreign minister. And I know this because I've actually... Yeah, smoked a few cigars and had some drinks with him and taken some time to say those exact things to him. And yeah, there's a lot of things that that he that he thinks that he needs to redress. And and I think, you know, we saw this in Fiji with Sidavani Rambuka when he apologized to the Indian population for his coups and the harm that that caused. It was and I think it's important that if politicians make mistakes. That they own up to those, and and all too often they get a a flash knighthood, and they bugger off to a fancy job somewhere else, and their mistakes are they never acknowledge their mistakes, and they still go on with how grand they were and how everything was great. And that Dunes and one of them, uh, John Key's another, Helen Clark, same. You know they they got these honors and these awards, um, for doing their job badly. And Winston Peters, love him or hate him, he's stuck around. And in some cases, he has fixed things and has redressed things. And I just want to give him another chance to, to, to do that again. I mean, he knows that he screwed up on the firearms thing, right? And you're going to see him come out and say that we screwed up and that he's sorry and that we need to fix it. And that we need to, instead of amending the Arms Act, we need to rewrite, we need to have a whole new Arms Act because it's not fit for purpose. Because he knows that him and his team screwed up on that, and okay. so well, I mean, that, that, it, it's that, always good when they can admit they're wrong about something. But this that's one, right. This one was quite big, Cam. For for oh, no, I understand, right? I, yeah. I understand, but but also you got to look at because I, it also we, affected our freedom of speech. That's the other thing is that one of those points of the my global migration compact was how the media were allowed to report about migrants coming into our countries. 
And when St. Peter's went on air, like a day later or two days later, and, you know, was trying to speak about all the migration in glowing terms, like completely like a newly minted UN puppet. And he, he should be called on that kind of thing. I, I'm with but you. Also, though, you I don't hate him. I don't hate him at all. But no, but Olivia, you've got to remember there's such a thing as, um, uh, you know, collective responsibility of Cabinet. And then he was the foreign minister. And if Cabinet decided that they were going to do that, he had to do that. That, that that's what's required of you as being a cabinet minister, even if you disagree with it, that you have to do that. And, no, and but they kept, they kept, we, everyone kept asking them at the time, are you going to sign the compact? And they said that there were no plans to, and it was done that weekend. It was. But if the prime minister, deceit. but if the prime minister and the cabinet decided they were going to sign it, he had to do it, whether he liked it or not. Otherwise, you bring the government down, and okay. that's not how you—that's not how you conduct a democracy. I mean, okay. John Key did the same thing, right? When he signed the UNDRIP, right, the the yeah. unit, the the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. You know why he signed it? Because he believed what Peter Sharples had told him that there were no Indigenous people in New Zealand. Everyone. Oh, what an idiot! Well, he signed it, and that know, has been the cause of the that has been the cause of the co-governance, and that's Absolutely. Far, far more. Uh, dangerous for Egregious. New Zealand. Yeah. Far more dangerous. With, with immigration, we can at least say, no, no, we're full. Sorry, you can't come in anymore. It's not immigration. It's refugees. Yeah, it does, That's immigration. You can still say no. Right? Well, it's, it, it was a particular type of, yeah, yeah, um, I know. Um, um, of immigration that was addressing refugees and the... the um, the UNDRIP the camps, is undermined. Those despicable camps that were right through Calais, right through Europe, right through Turkey. I mean, Turkey were emptying out their camps. We don't let them off over that camp. I'm not letting them off. What I'm saying to you is there are far more egregious things that have been done to this country that have destroyed the cohesion of society than letting in some refugees. And UNDRIP and co-governance is one of them. All right. Yeah. I Cam, do you reckon? Um, do you reckon he's um, gearing up for for to go out in a blaze of glory? Of do course you reckon he is. He's, he's he's about to um, talk about where some of the bodies are buried a bit more. Yes, oh, I do. Good. I believe that there is going to be a whole lot of dirt come out in this. Does he know that we're in the middle of a Marxist revolution? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So when Globally. when will when will this come out? Just so well, we can get the popcorn ready. <laughs> Oh, in uh, in the last seven weeks of the election campaign. Let's get to the biggest story in the world at the moment. Um, oh, and that is terrible. Trump. Let, let's nail that one down. And, Olivia, that's that's you. That's me. So the Trump and the indictments that he's just been subjected to in Florida. Um, every time an investigation into Biden or Clinton corruption is taking place, every time uh, the media industrial complex train their guns 100% on Trump and not Biden or Clinton, um, Mykola Zlokhevsky, a former Ukrainian minister, and he was Ukraine's ecology and natural resources minister um, and founder of Burisma Holdings, allegedly paid President Joe Biden when he was VEEP five million and dollars and possess and and um Mykola Zolesky, whatever his name is. Um, has 17 audio recordings as an insurance policy for the pay-to-play uh, scheme, according to um, Republican lawnma lawnmakers. Um, remember back when Joe was um, VP and he stupidly boasted in that awful video that he demanded the firing of Shokin, the prosecutor who was investigating Zlokovsky, Joe threatened, and it's on the record, that he and President Obama would withhold $1 billion worth of aid to the Ukraine if Shokin was not fired. So Shokin was fired, and that was pure quid pro quo, which they accused Trump of doing with his phone call to Zelensky back when he was president, when Trump was president. And remember, he got impeached for that. So last month, a whistleblower brought to light the existence of the FBI of a report, um, an FD-1023 document in which the informant alleges that um, President Biden and his family members engaged in this bribery scheme to get this $5 million. So Biden has been investigated for the bribe involving his son and Burisma uh, Gas Holdings, um, and the FBI have been ignoring a subpoena from the Senate Judiciary Committee to hand over the evidence in its entirety. 
So the box hoax, which is how Trump's termed this latest hoax, which is another attempt to imprison him for the umpteenth time, is the distraction forcing people to look away from the real scandal of the Biden corruption. Um, the indictment documents have come from the DOJ, the very same DOJ that fails to include any exculpatory evidence or information when it comes to people they go after, um, as we just learned from the Durham report regarding the, the Russian hoax. Anything exculpatory, they don't leak through or into the public domain. So the DOJ is trying to do what they've been doing for years, which is to imprison their most powerful political opponent, which is Trump. And if anyone believes this is a good faith action on the part of Merrick Garland's DOJ, um, and Trump really has done something terribly wrong, then they need a sanity assessment. Um, I don't believe a word of the indictment document. Um, I've just seen them lie too much about big stuff like Russia collusion. And we know that whatever they accuse Trump of doing is actually what they themselves have done, in fact. Um, and listening to the Democrats now bleat on about the rule of law, the rule of law mattering so much um, is just a sick joke um, from Cynicville. Um, if they cared about the rule of law, they would have made sure that Biden's house, which was had classified documents stashed in his garage, was raided. If they cared about the rule of law, they would have made sure that Hillary Clinton was prosecuted for a much worse offence. She actually did destroy 30,000 emails and five Blackberries and laptops, laptops which had been... With hammers, yeah. With the, by the FBI. And she totally got away with it without having to do any explaining. If you believe in the rule of law, and I do... Um, it has to be one law applied to all equally, regardless of their positions or politics. That is not the case anymore. Their idea of the rule of law means that there's one for the regime and another for the opponents of the regime, and that means Trump. So this is dangerous territory, and it's totally undermining the republic. In fact, it's going to rip the republic apart. Um, last piece um, on this from me. Senator Chuck Grassley made a long statement um, that instead of Christopher, Christopher Ray being charged with contempt for not providing the document under subpoena, the 1023 document, which is an unclassified document. Yeah, it's unclassified, yep. That Grassley says he has seen and read um, before the heavy redactions were made. So the FBI provided a heavily redacted version of the 1023 document with massive tracts of writing blocked out. And this redacted version went to the House Oversight Committee. Um, he calls for the, Grassley recalls for the unredacted document to be shown to the American people in the name of transparency. I mean, the Bidens are so corrupt. And yet at the moment, it's just look at Trump, look at Trump, look at Trump. And On national radio too. <laughs> radio. Well, you know. The I whole mean, media always, complex. You know, you'd think when um, Biden did, you know, when it came out that, yeah, there were about five or six members of the Biden family had, you know, been funneled money from all these foreign governments. Uh, you'd think it would be bigger news uh, than... Uh, but you know, I mean that that um, I, I listened to that uh, Senate hearing um, with uh, Josh Hawley um, questioning FBI direct, or Deputy Director Paul um, Abale uh, why they won't wouldn't simply release the document, and they would initially denied it, and then he sort of got a gotcha where he admitted that it it uh, and just listening to this guy squirm, yeah, uh, and. You know, he was asking about the quarter of a million Americans that had been surveilled um, and, yeah. you know, the, the stuff they did during the campaign of, of wiretapping Trump. None of this is news in New Zealand, which, I mean, you know, if you zoom out, who's telling our media what's off off limits? Because that's news. I mean, if you're a reporter, that's a huge, that's a well, front it's, page it's news. bigger story. than Watergate. Yeah. It's massive. Um, but you'll never get, you know, I mean, I, I listened to that too, where Josh Hawley was questioning that deputy director and also Ted Cruz got stuck in as well. And it was really good stuff. And I mean, I would encourage people to watch those hearings because they're just so flipping interesting for a start. But also, watch, yeah, watch them and reflect on why new, they're not, it's not news in New Zealand. 
Well, we don't but, but, have this. We, we don't have anything like this where our people are held accountable um, for corruption. We don't have these filmed um, committee grillings, you know. And meanwhile, we're just sleepwalking into. Well, I don't know. The being held accountable. Speaking to your point, Marty. Okay, so why do you think locally what? here it's ignored? I mean, you you can. Uh... You can go back to those warnings about the American military-industrial complex. I mean, it, it's uh, what we can see, and what we even what we're arguing about now is just the chessboard they're given us to play on. Um, and uh, yeah. you know, it's it's a it's a it's and it's so such a uh, audacious thing that uh, yeah, most people would rather go. Look, I can't even bear to. Think how much my house of cards will collapse if, if, if uh, you take that one out. Well, yeah. yesterday, yesterday, Lindsay was on and he was talking. Yeah. He made reference to this, and he and he, he made a joke about life, liberty, and and Lindsay. Yeah. And, and I made a point that I think you're talking about the United States. What happens if they are lost? And he says we are extinct. He said extinction. I heard extinction. That. Yeah, extinction. extinction. And that's so true. I mean, that's why we should be interested. <laughs> That's why we should be interested. And also, yeah, because, I mean, we are a little backwater democracy way down the bottom of the world, right? But if they can't make this work in America with all their checks and balances, imagine how easy New Zealand is to be walked into totalitarian. Um, it's very, very frightening. All right. Should we end on that note? Any last comments? Oh, Gaslighter. Who's the Gaslighter? Uh, make the mayor. Mayor of a party. The mayor. Okay, have we, have we found a, a suitable award yet? Have we been on to Alibaba to find something? Oh, oh we can look with a, a little bit more interest now that we've got a few of these under our wing. Yeah, and we'll send them out. We'll do a, a mass sending out. I think we've got three to send already. All right, okay, that's our politics panel for this week, Friday morning at RCR. Thank you, Cam Slater. Thank you. No Olivia, problems. Thank Olivia you. Pearson, great. Thanks, Paul. And Marty. Good to Thank hear you. from you again, too. And we'll be back uh, here doing the same thing this time next week on RCR. RCR with Paul Brennan, Reality Check Radio.